Uh, welcome everyone to our special session, Contextualizing Globe for Indigenous Communities. Um, and you know, we're, uh, it's a large space and not that many people, if you wanna conglomerate, condense a little bit, that's fine. If not, that's fine as well. But thank you again very much for participating, being part of our, uh, what we hope will be an interesting and stimulating conversation. Um, now, in Native communities, we always like to start uh, in a good way. And so I'd like to start, uh, invite Ren to kind of kick us off. Ren. Oh yeah, now calling for the help. So, uh, actually, this is fine because I have no slide just to share with you a few thoughts and what I refer to as a few good words. So Simon escaped because I had asked yesterday when he gave the land acknowledgement if I might borrow his words because I want to tweak it a little bit. And so if you'll permit me, some folks and you may have experienced some offer a blessing or prayer I am also a believer in the creator, but in a more spiritual way, and so I offer a few good words for our intentions, and I bring us together. And I'd like to begin uh, in my Eastern Shoshone way, that I acknowledge Simon and what he shared with you, and I'm going to repeat a few of his words, and I think this is why he took off, but he said he'd come back. Um, is we acknowledge our meeting is taking place on the traditional and unceded territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Sioux peoples. And we also recognize at least 49 contemporary indigenous tribes and nations who have historically called Colorado home, some of whom were forced out of the Rocky Mountain region some who were brought here, some who passed through historically and present day as well. We pay our respects to elders past, present, and future, and to all those who have stewarded the land and water for generations and who hope to continue to do so. My work with indigenous peoples and as an indigenous person, we must remember the social and environmental justices and injustices in order to gain a greater perspective of our work together as partners. So I am grateful. While my people, the Shoshone, pass through this landscape, we have stories from this landscape and with the other peoples here yesterday and today. I am also grateful to be here with you because we're learners together. We're also educators. And I'm grateful that we can understand in these ways how to go about this work that I'm learning is called GLOBE and is a big community and I'm excited about being here with you and learning more. And I'm grateful for the relationships we have, for you to engage in them more fully, to revisit them, and also to be with each other and gain new relationships. Let us now agree together to open this circle with good intentions and open minds. This is so we can learn together how to be both better educators and students for those we work with and ourselves. Ho -e -ho. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ren, very much. That was a perfect way to start the meeting. Um, and uh, we still have our slides up, but I, the, the, our next uh, action actual activity was for us to do introductions, uh, who we are, where we come from, 
why we're here, why this discussion is important to us. And my slides are basically just slides of AHEC, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, where I work, um, and something about AHEC and who we are, the tribal colleges, 37 tribal colleges and universities that are our membership, and the idea that uh, the tribal colleges are a perfect partner for GLOW. They're uh, a, a strong community presence in the communities, the tribal communities where they are. Ah. I think we're ready to go. Strong, uh, thank you very much. Uh, strong communities. Uh, oh, okay, uh, welcome overview. I jumped past a welcome and overview uh, very quickly about the overview. So we're gonna, our panel is basically three rounds. One round is introductions. One round is about the actual how and the what of contextualizing indigenous uh, or global for indigenous communities. And the third one is a little bit more drilling down into issues like um, indigenous research practice, uh, data sovereignty, data ethics, kind of a little bit of the nuts and bolts of, of how we bring uh, GLOBE to tribal communities in a way that's respectful and mutually beneficial. Uh, you know, one thing I've learned so far from the one and one quarter days that I've been here with the GLOBE annual meeting is how exciting, how powerful, how impactful GLOBE is and can be as it grows. You know, the whole idea of um, building out this network of knowledge creation of partners across communities, you know, smaller communities, um, engaging young people in, in the work, not only of learning science, but doing science and contributing knowledge to the general knowledge ecosystem that we're all a part of. And the important thing about um, indigenous communities, to my mind, is that they bring a different perspective. They bring a different understanding of knowledge and process and, and cause and effect. It's, it's, you could call it a different epistemology that contributes, that adds, that broadens the perspective of science generally. In, to my, in my opinion, and I, and I hope we have that conversation a little bit, not just today, but in the, in the coming months and years. The idea of integrating uh, uh, an indigenous perspective and globe, going in a global way, indigenous communities across the planet, all across the planet, if that's the right phrase, are the most vulnerable to climate change uh, challenges and the most in I think, ready for mobilizing networks of, of indigenous peoples, addressing similar issues, and taking similar approaches in doing that. So I'm, I'm, I don't wanna, I don't wanna say, I don't, I don't wanna make it sound like we're ready to take over GLOBE, but I think we would love to see how this partnership could evolve and grow and be a real, you know, it's transformative as it is. GLOBE is a, a, a transformative model, it really is. But bringing out, bringing in or building up that additional uh, dimension of GLOBE, I think is, uh, is, our, is, a, is, a, is an exciting challenge or exciting opportunity, I should say. Um, I, I guess that's all. Uh, I guess I should say a little bit more about Tribal College of 37. The, all, the point, uh, see I think I have a slide that actually says it. So it's our 50th anniversary started back in 1968 with uh, Navajo Community College, which is now Diné College, and now 37 tribal colleges, 35 of which are um, accredited, accredited institutions. Each one of them, as it says in the slide, uh, begun in ceremony and prayer, serving their communities, which is why they are ideal partners to bring GLOBE to uh, native communities. And sort of serve as, a, I should stop uh, there, but serving as a kind of a laboratory for a, for a global, global approach. Um, okay, and just a couple of things I should mention. So here's our, a couple of programs or initiatives that tribal colleges are involved with that are very globe, uh, 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 globe ready, globe uh, in, the same, in the same space as globe. Uh, United Tribes Technical College has the Intertribal Research and Resource Center on food sovereignty, the uh, the 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 Navo or the the National Science Foundation's Tribal College and University Program 
uh, their, um, uh, 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 what's the name of the program? Their, their Tribal Enterprise Advancement Program, the T program, funds up to $3.2 million for tribal college projects focused on building research programs that address tribal needs. That's for every tribal college that's available. To have a program that connects to uh, the community, that's the priority for, uh, for the, for the uh, uh, Tribal um, Enterprise Advancement Program. Integrating uh, um, programs and protocols from the, uh, from the GLOBE program, there's just opportunities to do that. The, the one thing I do want to mention before I move on, before we move on, move on sorry, is the uh, Native Fuse Alliance. It's another NSF-funded program. If you know the INCLUDES program, there are huge partnerships funded at like $10 million over five years, all around building a network of partners that focus on some um, uh, uh, broadening participation in STEM uh, uh, discipline area. And ours is uh, American Indian Alaska Native students in food, energy, and water systems. So it's a huge um, partnership. University of Arizona and Berkeley are the leads. The tribal colleges are all members. We were funded a small pilot grant. We were funded under that project to support uh, an initial uh, indigenized globe uh, project, which uh, Ren and Teresa are a part of. And they'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, so that's AHEC. That's me. That's the tribal colleges. Um, Ren, I think you're next. Can I request some of the leaders here? Oh, of course. Who are you, Al? Did I not say? Yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, in, a, in the interest of time, <laughs> so I'm Al Kushlikis. Uh, I guess you're right. I'm Al Kushlikis. I'm Senior Associate for Strategic Initiatives at the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. I've been a part of, or I've been lucky enough to be a part of the tribal college movement for since uh, the early 1990s um, when I started at Diné College uh, working on special projects, kind of what I do now but on a smaller scale. My, what brought me out to, uh, to Diné College, I'm actually ethnically 100% Lithuanian. Um, my parents came over from the old country uh, after World War the, the new old country, well, whatever, the old country, um, uh, after World War II. And I was raised at one, not 100%, but as much as possible in the US in, uh, uh, in the Lithuanian cultural you know, environment. The idea being that, uh, gosh, I don't want to take so much time. The idea being that um, we were all going to go back, that it was a temporary you know, relocation from from where we're all from. We're Baltic people. The Baltic tribes occupied that part of Europe uh, for like 6,000 years. So we kind of are, and I don't want to really say that, play it up in any way, but Lithuanians are among the Baltic people who are uh, indigenous to that part of Europe. Anyway, in graduate school, I, I studied cognitive anthropology. And my thought was, my interest was, looking at the relationship between language and cognition to understand how different, so it's kind of connect, connected to indigenous STEM, indigenous STEM, connect how language and culture influenced how people thought about the world. And so I went to Diné College to do that work, and I got so enthralled, not enthralled, uh, engaged in the issues that you see out there that are education, economic, social, health, uh, et cetera, that I thought, well, this is actually more important than worrying about cognitive uh, anthropology. So I dropped that and stuck with uh, tribal college work. Um, anyway, that's me, and I'm sorry it took so long. Uh, we don't have time for any more introductions. <laughs> sorry. Is that Dave? Good morning, good day to you. Nananya Ren Freeman Nasasani Na Arevich Mashikewak, a Scottish French. I am an Eastern Shoshone Wakpat woman 
and the distinction the distinction is culturally appropriate because there's woman knowledge, there's man knowledge, and so forth. So I respect that, and I'm grateful for the understanding that I've been afforded from my people to be a cultural citizen, you know, my homelands, my landscapes. And as we're coming together to understand this, I put together a little collage for you to understand who I am and why I'm here. So first and foremost, I acknowledge my land, being Eastern Shoshone, and the Eastern is an anthropological label. I come from the Num people, the Numina, and we are 54 bands strong as a linguistic family in this continent and further south. And where I was raised is in a community in Uredi, and that means Warm Valley. That is located, uh, again, in my Shoshone homelands in Wyoming, in an area called the Wind River Indian Reservation. The photo in the upper right, that's the little community called Fort Washakie, named after our last recognized chief, Washakie. And that's a whole other story I invite you to discover for yourselves, the history of my peoples. And so I grew up there among my people and communities, and we are people of the horse. Our histories align with the Ute and with horses way back when, a few hundred years ago, that the Spanish returned to this landscape. And we are also a people of buffalo. And so I acknowledge that. They are relatives. They are the sources of our knowledges. Culture is socially constructed. And so our environments help us to understand ourselves and how to be in relationship and interdependent with that world and those worlds. I am also a mother among being daughter and grandmother. I have three children, two daughters and a son. I have two grandsons. I was permitted to name my two grandsons. The eldest is Winterhawk, and he's named after Shoshone great uncle. The youngest is Ohamo, which translates to yellow hand. Uh, being Shoshone, I am also Comanche or Namina. Most people don't know that Comanche is actually Shoshone people, and through time and Western expansion, our people who committed their lives to tending our humongous horse herds were captured, held in the corridor of Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma. But Comanche are my people. And Ohamo, Ohamagoya, Old Man Yellowhand, is an ancestor. So I named my youngest grandson after him. I am also grandma and now mom to a fur baby, Foley. He is of a British breed. He's a beagle, and he is my companion. And I would also like to say that academically, I received my undergraduate degree here at DU, Inter and Cross-Cultural Communication, that I was on my way to work with the UN working in conflict resolution. I am a student of positive conflict. And also, my MA work is through the University of Oklahoma in Norman. I'm an anthropologist. I am an indigenous four-field anthropologist. My philosophy could not specialize. It goes against. It is about being social, cultural, linguistic, bio, physical and also archaeological. And I've had a great deal of fun working in all those fields, learning how to collectively work in that discipline and to teach from it. I am Dr. Freeman. I received my PhD from the University of Montana in Missoula. And uh, it's been a challenge working within four fields at the same time. But again, it is a philosophy, and it's something I hope to share more with you here and in further conversations. 
in 2021, I was able to apply my science side. I am an applied scientist. I am a Sloan-funded applied scientist. My personal research sought to and seeks to understand impacts to indigenous knowledge systems and indigenous traditional knowledges from use of remote sensing and GIS technologies within tribal landscapes. So I got to go home and I got to visit lots and lots of people I've always known, learn new people, and to work from a very science but native science perspective. And again, you'll learn more about what that means. I am learning how to walk and work in that world. In 21, 2021, I became the director and research coordinator of the Indigenous Research Center at the Salish Kootenai College in Pablo, Montana. It is an NSF funded hope and desire as a model that will roll out to other tribal colleges across the country to learn how do we go about doing this work. So three objectives, it's about exploring what are indigenous research methodologies and methods from an educator's perspective, building capacities and sharing all that knowledge. So that's what I do. I think it's 24-7. Um, I teach and mentor students and faculty to build capacity. All of this is within the realm of an understanding of partnership, not just collaboration, but partnership. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm on the shorter end here. Skuktash, um, Amayan Chuki, Teresa Newberry. That means good day. My name is Teresa Newberry in the Otham language. And I too put together a collage about myself. Our theme for this round is really who and why. And really, because when we're talking about indigenous, you know, indigenous communities, it's about relationship and who we are. So the first uh, picture up there, that's me and my children. When they were younger, they're both grown now. But I love um, that photo uh, because many good things happened that day. That was actually my first day at Tanawatam Community College where I serve as chair of science and health. I started there in 2005. And, uh, but before that, oh, let me just talk a little bit about my family and my background. Um, I am of German-Irish descent. My mother uh, is from Germany, and she came here um, to the U.S. where I was born. So a lot of my family on that side is in Germany. They're farmers. They're people of the land. And on my, Irish, my father's side, I'm of Irish descent. Um, my great-grandfather was born in Ireland, and all of my Irish relatives went to Newfoundland, and then my grandparents came to Boston. And on that side, they're people of the sea, so they're fisher people. So really the land, nature, was always very much part of my life and growing up and, and also living in multiple different cultural communities. My father was in the Air Force, so um, we not only went back home and lived in Germany for a while, and I was in a bilingual household, but I also lived in North Africa, and I lived in Guam. And when I lived in Guam, I learned Chamoran. <laughs> I've always loved languages. And I was adopted by a Chamoran family and really learned how to cook, right? Food tradition is very important wherever you are. I went to Japan. So wherever I went, I um, really connected with the land. Because as a child, in this moving environment, nature was always, for me, the central part of my life. So then as an adult, it was very natural uh, that I uh, studied ecology. And so the next pictures of me are in my waders. And I was at the University of Michigan 
and I studied um, with the School of Natural Resources, aquatic ecology, paleoclimatology. I was always interested in how climate impacted uh, waters, land, um, people, and plants. And so then from there, I went to the University of New Mexico for my doctoral work where I studied trees. And I, um, the picture there is of me uh, studying pinyon pine. And I looked at short-term and the impacts of short-term climatic variability and long-term climatic variability on water relations of pinyon pine. And so that's me with the ERGA there, infrared gas analyzer. So really, it's all about water and carbon and you know, responses of the ecosystem to uh, the different spatial and temporal um, scales. It always really fascinated me. So a lot of things fascinated me. <laughs> so then I moved to Arizona, and I worked with the University of Arizona Tree Ring Lab as a visiting scholar. And there was uh, something really happened in my life which um, set me in a, a new direction. And I met um, the late Frances Manuel. Um, she's pictured there. She's a very well-known elder in the autumn community. And we became friends. And she invited me to her house. So I was a graduate student doing science, very hardcore geochemistry. <laughs> and on Fridays, I would go and sit with Frances. And she would tell me her story. She would teach me songs. And she really uh, instilled in me this sense of the importance of language and culture. And she always lamented the loss of, of the language, her language, because that's intrin intrinsically tied to culture. So when Tan Autum Community College started, it actually started in 1998, but when a position opened up, I applied for it right away. And so uh, that was in 2005. So Tan Autum Community College is, it serves the Tan Autum Nation. And um, it is in the red is the reservation now, but the ancestral lands you can see are in the outline there. And it does span the borders. The ancestral lands do go down into Mexico. And a very fascinating uh, point is that their ancestral lands are bounded by rivers in the north, west, and south. And so even though Tano Atom, Tano means desert, Atom means people. So there are people of the desert, but water is very central to the culture, even such that it defines their geographical uh, landscape. And the picture there is Wagiwuk. And Wagiwuk is the center of the autumn universe. And there's many stories about Wagiwuk. And um, these are the kinds of things you learn as a tribal college uh, faculty member. And I've been fortunate enough to be serving Tan Autum Community College since 2005. So I have learned a lot. <laughs> and I've learned a lot from my students who are pictured there. Um, I'm all about student success. It's about graduating them and then having them move on and fulfilling their dreams. I've also, uh, Francis was my first indigenous mentor, but I've had many along the ways. Um, notably, um, Dr. Gregory Cajete. Uh, I did go back to the University of Arizona and took graduate courses in indigenous education and, um, and also worked with elders at the community college. Um, the elder that is very significant for me in my work right now is Mr. Camillus Lopez. He's pictured there in the red. And you'll hear a little bit more about our work and our work with the man in the maze and, and really um, working to provide education that, as we say, is rooted in the hymn dog. And the hymn dog means the ways of knowing of the autumn people. And so the other reason I'm here today is that I am part of the FUSE Alliance project and working with GLOBE and working with how GLOBE can be, um, um, what's the word for it? <laughs> Contextualized, I think. There's, we're still working this out, right? Woven into um, our, the tribal communities and uh, so that's really, I've, I've had a long history of doing this work. I actually built the program at TOCC uh, with the, the mission in mind. Um, so this will be the next step in terms of uh, working with GLOBE and how um, that 
and TCU will work in partnership. So you'll hear more about that later. I don't want to get ahead of myself. So thank you. It's hard to be short. <laughs> I'm here. I think I'll do this. Mag <laughs> Magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. Ako ay nagagalak na tayo ay nagtitipon dito. It's good morning, everyone. I'm really delighted that we are gathered here today. Um, so I'm Elena Sparrow. I was born and raised in the Philippines, an island nation in the tropics. And I now live in the Arctic, in Alaska. And so I have lived now more than, I, uh, more than 35 years in Alaska. So I consider myself an Alaska Pino now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so in, in the, when I was growing up, my mother told us, so I'm the youngest of six children, and she raised us uh, by herself. She was widowed twice. She was widowed at 21, and then a widow again around 40. And so she said, I do not have riches to give to you. I don't have land to give to you, but education, I am going to try my best. And so for every peso that she earned, she saved 10 centavos out of it towards our education. And she said, I never wanted to hear anybody tell me that, well, if you can't afford to send your kids to school, then don't. I mean, you don't need to borrow. And so she never borrowed money from people. She, she worked really hard. And so that's the legacy that I have from her. And so when I was growing up, I wanted to be a medical doctor. Reality is we couldn't afford it. It meant that I would have to go somewhere else and, and have to pay board and lodging plus all the cost of the university. So we lived close to a university, University of the Philippines, and it was offering four degrees, one in agriculture, forestry, home technology, and another one that I can't remember. But I thought agriculture, that's how I can help people, feeding the world, you know. And then there was a woman who was a soil microbiologist, and I thought, wow, I would like to be a soil microbiologist. So she was my mentor in, in, in the university, and I became a soil microbiologist. And I worked at the International Rice Research Center as soon as I graduated from college. And now I'm working at the International Arctic Research Center. And my, why am I here in, in included in this panel? I, am, I started the GLOBE program in Alaska uh, oh, as soon, almost as soon as GLOBE started. We chose Alaska, we chose the GLOBE program as the best program to when we were asked as a team, along with other teams from different states in the United States, how we would communicate climate change to the public, to the general public. And I said, so our team of educators, and I was the scientist on the team, uh, decided to look at all the programs, environmental programs, and we said, this is it, GLOBE is it, because then students can learn how to really observe, take measurements, make their own decisions, and then find out what they can do to address the problem. And you know how kids, they learn something at school, they come back very excited and they say, mom and dad, we can do this, we gotta recycle, we gotta, we, we, we have to think of our environment, we need and so we thought that was the way, and, and GLOBE was it. And so um, before uh, I go further, I would like to acknowledge the land on which 
I am based at in Fairbanks, Alaska. In Alaska, there are more than 220 tribes. In, in the United States, there are about 500 tribes, and in Alaska alone, 220. And so there are many different languages, the many different tribes. And the land that I, our university stands on, uh, I would like to acknowledge the land of the lower Tanana Dene people who have long stewarded the land. This is unceded land that we are on. And we, it's called the uh, Troth Yeda, which means potato ridge, where they used to harvest potato. It's uh, a, a native potato. It's nothing like the regular potato that we'd be having at breakfast. But um, so we acknowledge that and their long-term stewardship. And I am dedicated, and our program is dedicated to continuing to respect and to work towards uh, the self-determination uh, of the people who have long lived uh, on this land and including their, their children and the youth. And so most of the people that I work with are indigenous youth. Um, so I think that's, that's good enough for my introduction. Thank you. Tena koto katoa. Um, greetings to you all. I would like to mihi or acknowledge first uh, Te Atiawa, the iwi or tribe of Whanganui Atara or Wellington, where I live in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And also mihi or acknowledge uh, Kaitahu, the iwi or tribe of Otatahi or Christchurch. Uh, where I come from and where I was born in New Zealand. And I will introduce myself in a traditional te reo Māori uh, fashion called a pipiha. Ko Auraki te maunga, ko Opawaho te awa, no Tauiwi aho, no Otatahi aho, ko Metcalf toku Fano, ko Briani toku Tamahini, Ko Wikitoria toku ingoa, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. To explain that to you, I talked about uh, a mountain that is special to me in this context, uh, a river that's special, uh, the city I come from, my family name, my daughter's name, and her relationship to me, my name, and I greeted you three times. I also spoke about how I am to iwi, and the literal translation of that is I'm from the other people, not of Aotearoa, New Zealand. In this context, what that means is I, I was born in New Zealand, but I am not descended of the indigenous people of the land of New Zealand, so I'm not Maori. And as such, I am not representing Maori in any fashion here today. I'm not speaking for them, but I do hope that I am uh, honouring uh, Māori sort of customs or tikanga, uh, the culture of New Zealand, the, the language or the reo of New Zealand, and I'm here really representing my country as country coordinator of GLOBE in New Zealand. So in terms of my ancestry, my father was a horticulturalist and a prolific writer of books about native New Zealand plants total expert in that space, and my mother was a pharmacist. So I had a very scientific upbringing. And as a family, with my older siblings, brother and sister, we spent a lot of our childhood in the bush, up the mountains, and for me in particular, developing a real love of the marine environment. So I went on and became a scientist at university, specialising in biochemistry and genetics, and then using those tools in the marine biology space, particularly in Antarctica. Was an academic and researcher for many years before I moved more into science, communication, engagement, education and outreach. More latterly, uh, education-centred relationships uh, and also um, 
career pathways and strategy. But in a role that I had where I was for half a decade, five years, national coordinator of something called the Participatory Science Platform in New Zealand, which is a, a government fund to support community-based science and technology projects, I had a beautiful class of 11 to 12 year old kids who were funded uh, by one of the projects we supported and they gave me a new professional nickname, the Queen of Curiosity. And I like to think that I'm still very curious, just as curious as I was in the child, as a child. So uh, that's a blessing to have that name. Why am I here? Uh, through, through that role in particular, the roles that have followed, and all my engagement and work with youth, schools, and with things like GLOBE, I am so passionate about democratising science, about making it a more level playing field, and the role that communities play in the science process, that everyone should and can have a seat at the table. I'm really passionate about language use of indigenous language, so reo Māori for me, and how that can have a place in a science context. And I'm really passionate about indigenous knowledge uh, and how that can be incorporated or sit on its own as a knowledge source uh, with science as well. And I'm really passionate too, finally, about equity and the role that community science like GLOBE and other approaches can play in helping us achieve a shift towards equity, which is so needed and deserved. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody. Thank you very much for the introductions. And uh, actually we're an hour in now um, and it, it's, technically an hour and a half session, but I'm hoping that you'll all stay for two hours because we're just getting ready to get into the meat of the discussion uh, about um, our ideas for uh, contextualizing GLOW for indigenous communities. Um, and so our first, well maybe uh, kind of take a page out of John's book. If you'd all like to maybe stand up, stretch a little bit, it's been an hour, just very quickly and then uh, we'll resume. Uh, very, yeah, that's right, jumping jacks would be a good thing. <laughs> Anything that moves the circulation a little bit, that would not be bad. Again, you know, thank you all. And there will, this was promised to be a conversation, not a, you know, not a one-way one -way, uh, discussion. So we are, at, we'll be asking you all to provide your input, your thoughts, your comments after the next two sessions. Um, so uh, our very next, so I guess we're ready to start. Uh, our very next, the question you see there, how do we weave GLOBE into local indigenous knowledge systems? Um, and uh, just as a very quick thought, I would say one thing that we've talked about and, and Therese will talk more about is that there's, you can generally, and I'm speaking now for indigenous, for any community, that if you can find a core metaphor, a core, um, a collection of, uh, of meaningful um, associations that, that, that tell a story, that, that convey a story, that that story can be the framework for an indigenous uh, knowledge, uh, ap approach to indigenous knowledge in GLOBE. I'll just say that and others will say more, who know a lot more than I do. And first of all, first off is, While we're um, transitioning here, why don't you turn to the person beside you and greet or say hello in your indigenous language, if you know it. Give it a go.
Okay, hopefully you've all had a chance to, to start to say hi. And now that you're starting to find out a bit more about new friends, you can um, continue those conversations and learning of new words um, throughout the rest of the meeting here, which would be wonderful. Build those relationships and those connections. So in terms of a how and a what, I wanted to provide some New Zealand or Aotearoa context. And the way I'm gonna section both this and, and my next section, shall I dance, um, is, uh, to start from kind of explaining a bit of a Māori or te ao Māori world view and so give the New Zealand context and then drill down to a bit of policy and then some specific case studies. And what I hope that each time I'm speaking that you're thinking about is whether there is something equivalent that you know about in these spaces in your own countries and also, if there isn't or you don't know about it, what might be the process that you can go uh, through to research what the... It's quite distracting. Um, could it go on silence? Um, uh, the, the process of researching, because I know that you're all very capable of researching and researching well. So just a bit of a, a thought-provoking um, positioning for you. So some key words to think about in the New Zealand context uh, relate to people and their relationship to the land. Tangata whenua is people of the land, and they are the Maori people of New Zealand. Mana whenua also indicates a relationship with the land, and specifically it is about the mana or the status that the person has connected with the land and vice versa. And in a Maori concept, um, whakapapa is a term that means ancestry. And ancestry in the Maori worldview is not about my relationship with my ancestors on its own. It's accepting that there is a relationship of you with the land, that you are connected to the land, to the air, to the water, and every living thing. So that is your ancestry. So mana whenua means that you cannot be separated from the land. You are kind of born to that title, and you cannot ever come apart from it. So it's a very important concept. And it's, it's Integrated, I guess, as a concept within something called Tatirati or Waitangi. So that is our founding colonial settlement document with Māori or the Treaty of Waitangi. In some ways it's a blessing or a, a good thing that New Zealand has this, but it hasn't been upheld over many generations and we're doing a lot of reparation work in this space. But the intent of Tatirati is very clear that it gives chieftainship and this concept of mana whenua still to Māori. That is intended in the document, even if it hasn't been, uh, had generations of adhering to that. Um, and also it gives the concept that Māori are entitled to protection and use of their taonga or their, their treasures. That's all resources, whether it's using something for food, or it might be just a very special thing to them as a taonga. This is a taonga, this is ponamu, or greenstone, or jade. Our language is also being heavily revitalised, te reo Māori, very strong movement, and from next year I think all school students will be uh, com uh, compulsory to learn some te reo, which is wonderful. So it's been revitalised in many contexts. And there are some Māori worldviews or, or values that I think are really important, and you will have equivalent ones. That, they're common to humanity, I think. So to name a few, kaitiakitanga, or guardianship, is a really important concept. It's guardianship of the environment, but also of people. Uh, Fanonatanga is another very central one. Here it's listed as participation, but really it's about the process of relationship building. It's finding out who you're interacting with. And the third key one is manakitanga. Listed here in its most basic sense is hospitality, but really mana is about status, and it means that whenever I'm interacting with you, I'm always upholding your status. 
I'm never lessening that. So it's a very, very key concept. And mātauranga is listed there as knowledge and understanding. Mātauranga Māori is a, a word that arose out of colonisation as the concept of the Māori uh, knowledge system. And it's, if you do a Google search, it's become heavily politicised. But there are luckily some, I guess, some strengths, um, some uh, pushing for a lot more funding, like the funds on the right-hand side, including Curious Minds, of which the, the participatory science platform I mentioned is part of that overall fund, uh, to recognise the value of Mātauranga Māori and provide spaces for it to grow and to be used, either on its own or integrated or woven into uh, other, no, no, other knowledge systems like science. Rangaho is the Māori word for research, so they have their own concepts around research and have been doing science for many hundreds of years. In the education space, the New Zealand curriculum provides a space for mātauranga Māori to be taught the concepts and uh, the use of, and there is also a Māori curriculum Curriculum for uh, schools that teach exclusively in Te Reo Māori called Tamaru Tanga or Aotearoa as well. The curriculum in New Zealand is being refreshed at the moment into three sort of approaches of understand, know and do. And from next year, all schools in New Zealand are required to teach New Zealand histories, which means really the history of colonisation and the horrific decimation of Maori people that occurred over the process of colonisation, never been required to be taught before. But what's really wonderful in that teaching is that local tribes are being given funding to support the telling of their own local histories and all schools have to connect with a local tribe to learn about that local history. And that provides a space too for Mātauranga Māori, that Māori knowledge system, to sit in there as well. So just a couple of examples from different perspectives of community science projects, one led by iwi, or tri Indigenous Māori tribe, and one led by uh, a Pakiha or the Western scientist, as we would say, um, that both embrace the concept of Mātauranga Māori. So the one on the left was about a, a river, a, waterway that's very important to a particular sub-tribe, the Otarau uh, Hapu in Taranaki. And they took school students out onto the waterway in kayaks or waka to experience the environment in situ to do very sort of standard like globe protocols of water quality testing and think about the habitat destruction and how that ecosystem can be restored. But importantly, the students also got to hear from elders of that particular sub-tribe and hear the history of that river and how the tribe or the sub-tribe had used their own mātauranga Māori approaches to ecosystem-based management in a historical sense. In particular, the placing of rahui or bans on the use of sections of that river as need be in periods of history until the river recovered sufficiently for there to be use of the waterway for uh, resource, like um, collecting food. The project on the right is about moths and it was about school students setting up moth traps in their own school community, trapping the moths, using a scientist to support the identification of what species were found in schools around the country. The idea of this project was for students to understand that moths are cool. Um, moths are really important in the ecosystem for ecosystem health and are very, very important pollinators. One of the schools involved was a Maori-speaking kura, or school, and they were horrified that you would have to kill the moths in order to understand what was there. That culturally did not sit right with them. The compromise was that they were, the protocols were modified to support their cultural wishes in this space so that they took less moths. 
they also developed a specific cutter care or blessing that they said before the moths were put in the freezer so that they recognised what the moths were giving, they up in terms of a sacrifice for greater knowledge, they recognised their link to the moths and the history of the moths. Barbara Anderson, the scientist on this project, was amazing. She produced these resources for every school. They were regional specific. They listed the Maori names of the moth alongside the taxonomic names of the moth with these beautiful photos. Importantly, they also included stories based on Maori mythology of how important moths were to, to Maori. And the guides were produced in both either English or Reo Maori. And what's an important step, I think, for people in New Zealand or elsewhere is the Maori version was not a literal translation of the English. It was its own thing. So a couple of key examples of how you can take indigenous knowledge and incorporate it into projects no matter what side you're coming from. Thank you. So in Alaska, even though we have cultural standards uh, on how it is for indigenous, it's not a requirement, uh, unlike in the way it's operating. And so we have to approach it differently. We um, do it through professional development workshops um, uh, with educators. But now we are also in our professional development workshops, we include community members because in Alaska, uh, educators, especially in the remote areas, don't stay, they stay a year or two and then they leave. And, and so we want to have continuity of our work. Uh, and, and of course, the community members want their youth connected with the environment and continuing the ancestors' um, knowledge and, and familiarity and taking care of the environment and relationship where everything is related, not only to the trees and to the living things, but also to the rocks, to the water, to the soil. And so we developed a framework we called um, an, uh, an inquiry model based upon, in, in the indigenous, in our, in Alaska, it's more like, it's not linear, but it's circular, you know, based on the seasons of the year, where it starts from sp uh, spring, summer, fall, winter, and so we based it on seasonal. And so uh, the same with the inquiry model, where instead of having a, you know, ask a question, uh, have a hypothesis experiment, so we used that but made it into circular. So this framework we developed, uh, funded by uh, another NASA program, and using local knowledge, GLOBE and NASA, to make STEM learning locally relevant and have an impact. So instead of the five E's in the, in the teaching, we start with, we'd also have five E's, but starting with elder, elder and local knowledge. Start from what the indigenous uh, people uh, have been observing. And, and so the teachers and the students talk with the elders and find out and discover what the youth and the adults would like to to know about, to identify key climate change issues for community and brainstorm investigation and stewardship ideas. And so with GLOBE, and we have seen it many times, where students not only study, but also take action after they have studied, they have done an investigation. So we wanted to continue that. Um, and so they do culturally responsive activities uh, in, we have partnered, one of the things that we have done is partner with an indigenous uh, education uh, organization, the Association of Interior Native Educators. In every region, they have this native educators, but it's the interior association that has uh, been in con uh, existence for the longest time. Um, and so, um, 
so then they explore and then they experiment, do the experiment, and then uh, evaluate, explain, and then apply. And so um, I just want to give you a history of uh, how we built on prior work. When I first started the GLOW program, I knew that we had to reach, uh, to make it relevant to the indigenous students. And so even as we had scientists and educators in our, com in our uh, uh, workshops, we would also bring elders. And we brought the elders even to Arizona and uh, Hawaii and to, to, to uh, uh, share them with them the framework. But it is building on prior work. The Association of Interior Native Educators started their curriculum from educators attending science camps uh, with elders showing them the things that they know, how to, how to fillet fish, how to make uh, 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 boots and uh, how to uh, harvest bark for many different purposes. And, and so, so as the Association of Interior Native, and then the educators would go home after the science camps uh, with the elders and write curriculum, how to make uh, snowshoes and, and all that. And so we have in our project taken some of this starting on curriculum that is indigenous and then bringing in the GLOBE protocols, like for green up. So is it time to, when is it time to harvest uh, bark for making different projects, baskets, canoes and stuff? What, what is happening with the birch tree from which you harvest? And so you, you bring in the green up, uh, GLOBE green up, uh, protocol, and then in the fall, when when uh, people are doing their subsistence harvesting, hunting, uh, when there are leaves still on the trees, it's hard to see the animals for harvest. And so, observing when the leaves turn color and then fall is an important part. And so that's when the uh, globe green down can be done, and and so on. We're we're trying. And, and uh, I guess the metaphor that we use is the word, instead of integrating, because I was asked, so if we integrate, which knowledge system is being lost? And we don't want to lose it. And so I thought, you know, braiding, but in some, some indigenous communities, braiding uh, is sacred because that's a part of a ceremony. So weaving, you know, where you can still see all the elements of the, the things that you are weaving along. And so whatever mo metaphor is, how do we, how do we blend and, and apply the different knowledge systems? Because it is to our benefit for building on the knowledge that the students that come and work with us and that we work with to build on their knowledge based on their knowledge system and how we, instead of saying, oh no, that's not good, we, we, we build on that and continue building so that we, it's, it's a much richer uh, education that they get. Um, and so then, this is just an example of how we apply the, the framework, we had, uh, uh, in 2018, we brought a group of students who did their project. We started with a teacher and, uh, and an elder, uh, and the students talked with the elder and they noticed their uh, homes getting uh, into the river because of permafrost degradation. Permafrost is a ground that has been frozen continuously for more than two years. And because of the warming, uh, this ground has been thawing and degrading, and so the houses have been sliding into the river and getting lost. So the students wanted to learn what are the factors that are affecting this uh, erosion. And they used GLOW protocols, soils, and, and the clouds, and the temperature, and soil temperature, and moisture, and they presented it at the um, uh, 2018 uh, Globe Learning Exhibition. And they were 
the, the first question they asked me when I told them that they had been awarded and selected to go and present their project was, can we uh, share who we are? And of course I said, I was, I said, of course you can. I, that's my, if there's no, you know, if I work hard enough, maybe there, the students will never ask that question that they will feel that they can share who they are whenever and wherever they are. And so they, because it's part of their training, uh, storytelling, so they wrote a story in, in form of a song that they danced to. It's their story about their project and how loss of land is loss of heritage to them. And so, so we followed this, this framework. Um, and the education dynamics, uh, the historical trauma, colonizing education system, the revolving door of educators that I had mentioned to you, and no statewide systemic education addressing indigenous history, lands, and laws like you have for um, New Zealand. And, um, and the immense amount of chains in our lands, animals, and marine life with, with this climate rapid uh, climate, uh, environmental impacts, and the huge geographic area where we are in Alaska. It's one-fifth the size of the United States. And so addressing equity, we think inclusion of multiple knowledge systems and indigenous protocols is key. And teams attend PD and the professional development and carry out stewardship projects. And there is intergenerational involvement. And the partnerships is significant because it's not just the products that we do, but the process of how we do things. We, there is a tension when we're trying to make space for each other system of knowledge in, in how we plan the workshop which knowledge system is going to be honored first? We start now with indigenous knowledge. We've flipped the model where we always start with the Western science. Now, if we say that we're indeed honoring indigenous systems, we should start with it. Because for the longest time, it has been set aside or ignored. And in the respect, you know, we have to remember about respect and developing and building on trusting relationships. And so the main, uh, and so addressing empowerment, you know, who has access to Western science and expertise. And through the GLOBE program, we are offering it as a tool for use, not only in education, but also in climate adaptation plans in communities learning how to collect, recognize, and analyze data at the local, regional, and global scale through the GLOBE program and the NASA resources. And yes, yeah, okay. The key takeaways, uh, having an evolving model that addresses access, equity, empowerment, and then the significant ingredients that I have already told you about. Thank you. All right, so when we planned this panel, we actually spent a long time trying to decide the questions uh, we were go going to ask. And the second part of that question is, uh, for this session, is who leads the way and who decides? And you've already heard a lot of, about that, but I'm gonna be a little more explicit when I talk about the work that I do, because again, I work for a tribal college, Tanatum Community College, and TCUs are colleges that are chartered by their communities. And they're really, each of the TCUs has a unique mission. And preserving culture and language is part of every TCU's mission. And in addition to that, uh, the missions of tribal colleges are also about self-determination, sovereignty. 
So that's very, very important. And so at TOCC, I want to say the elders lead the way. Again, E comes first, right? <laughs> but it's a little bit different because in terms of the timeline, this was back in 1998 when the college was chartered. And so that's why I have the pictures of the elders in their uh, traditional round dance and then the man in the maze, which is the central cultural metaphor. And our college motto is our dream fulfilled. So you can see from the mission of TOCC, it's to enhance our unique Sana Atom Himdog. And Himdog is the culture way of life. It's really, it's everything uh, about um, the Tana Atom. And then also uh, that's through providing holistic uh, quality higher education services. And so then you really have to ask yourself, what is holistic? That's the question. All of us faculty at TUC, TCUs ask ourselves, what does that really mean and how do we operationalize that in our classrooms and in our education and at the college? So to kind of help us along the way, um, the elders did put together what's called Teshoshon. And Shon actually means root. So these are, these are the root, this is the basis by which we act and decide and interact with each other. And this is just a subset of, of many, many different core values that are within the Himdag. But um, the first one is to Wohochudidak, our beliefs, to Apadak, our well-being, to Peak Ulija, our deepest respect, and Iwumta, working together. So uh, when I came to TOCC in 2005, I was asked to build a science program that followed the mission of the college. I didn't have the tools, which is why I did go and get additional information. I worked with elders, and we've tried um, different things along the way to the best of our ability, but always following the guidance of the elders and the guidance of the community. And so kind of roll the clock forward. Um, I'm currently PI and project director on a grant called Pathways to Indigenous STEM in autumn, Machidak Walk STEM We, which means walking towards STEM. And in this project, we're working with, uh, you know, usually at a TCU, I, you, I, there's high turnover, <laughs> right? And so every tribal college faculty member comes in and does it their own way, and, and there's not a lot of cohesiveness. I've seen that through the years because I'm one of, uh, kind of a rare breed of having been at TCU for so long. Um, and also uh, along the way, as chair of the science program, I had to really uh, look at, are we really fulfilling our mission? At, and how do you assess whether or not you're giving um, you know, holistic education? How do we really strengthen the autumn hymn dog? And so from there, I looked to using a cultural metaphor and this, a lot of this thinking does come from uh, the work of AHAC, the Indigenous Evaluation Framework, and also Dr. Gregory Kehete, who really um, expressed the fact that to, to have culture-based education, you really have to, you know, to bring in another E word, epistemology, that, you know, when we bring the elders in, that's what we're bringing in, the epistemology, the worldview, the root, the root of the culture which is really not expressed in the written wor word, it's expressed orally, songs, stories. And so uh, in the project that I currently have, we've been working on applying the man in the maze, and there's an image there, you can see the man and, um, in the maze, and of course it's for all people. <laughs> That's the limitations of the English language, right? It's actually ee toy ki, ee toy is the, is the big brother, elder brother, and key meaning home. So really it's connected to the stories of the Atsum people and the origin stories and, and Wagiwok. There's a lot of cultural information. But really importantly about the man in the maze is that is identity. When students uh, have an education based on the man in the maze, you know, not just for assessment purposes, but also when we are framing our education with, you know, you are, uh, this is your journey, this is your education, it really um, sparks them in a very, you know, inner way. It really, they can identify 
they take ownership of their uh, education. So um, I'm going to go back to the first bullet before I talk a little bit more about the man in the maze. So basically, we are working to indigenize the science curriculum, strengthen culturally responsive academic support. And so cult there's a difference between culturally responsive and culturally based. And we actually do both at TOCC. So a lot of what we're doing is working with the faculty, training them um, in how to incorporate community, language, land, stories, action-oriented education. So that's kind of one strand of what we're doing the other part is working with the man in the maze, and that's really framing our whole curriculum based on this idea of the journey. And interestingly enough, our four journeys are knowing, understanding, applying, and sharing. So you've already heard it from, there's a commonality, right, between the communities. Uh, so as I mentioned, the man in the maze represents one's journey through life, and in the journey of life, Four times you enter the, the center spot, which is a sacrament. And in the life journey, that is birth, puberty, marriage, and death. But you can also think about it in terms of the academic journey. When you can think about it, when you, when you finish one stage of learning, you stop and you reflect. And so this is really speaks to the holistic nature of education, when you think of education as a journey, as a transformative process, as finding your true inner self. And a lot of what I understand about how to apply the maze and everything I know about the man in the maze comes from Mr. Cam Camillus Lopez. And we have worked together for since 2015 on this. Lots of conversations, lots of thought. And uh, we're piloting this in the science program we're not speaking for the whole college or for the nation. We're working on this and it's kind of a little incubator to see where it goes. So the elders always say the education needs to be rooted in the hymn doc. So that's our um, goal. So just to give an example, this is a uh, Saguaro Phenology and Climate Change PBL. And I really love um, problem-based learning. Um, because in problem-based learning, that's when you really can have student-centered activities. It's really um, an opportunity to kind of remove the hierarchy and have students bring in their own knowledge. So validating knowledge is really important. And so if you have a well-designed PBL, you can really provide those opportunities for students. And the other thing about a PBL, I mean, we. As educators, right, we all love PBLs, but you really have to put a lot of thought into it. What is your central problem? Is it meaningful for students? Is it culturally relevant? Uh, will they be able to, well, of course, you have to meet your learning objectives, but really, how will it, um, is it, is it rooted in the community? And so the Saguaro is really, for the Autumn people, the name in uh, Autumn is Hashan, and there are many, many Hashan stories. And Hashans are humans. And you can see um, there's the autumn calendar. And with the autumn calendar, June, or the Hashan Bak Mashad, uh, Mashad meaning month, Hashan Saguaro. So it's the Saguaro fruit ripening month. That's the beginning of the autumn new year. So the, when the fruits ripen is when the rains come. So again, it's central, centered around water. The autumn new year is when the water comes. And an elder once told me that if, if you, um, well, on the autumn nation, some parts are drier than others. So in the West, where it's drier, water becomes even more sacred because it's so meaningful when it falls. It is life. It is life itself, as well as the saguaros. So in this um, PBL, the central question is, how will climate change impact uh, flowering and fruiting in saguaros and the Sonoran Desert? So they learn about the basic ecology. They learn about climate. The flowering time of saguaros differs depending on where you're at. Uh, so they really have, there's a lot of science. There's a lot of math. And, but along with that, we include stories, songs. We bring the elders in. 
And so they learn about the culture and they learn about the traditional harvesting practices. They go out and they actually harvest the saguaros. And so in the end, they have to really put this together and, 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 and they work in groups, Iwumta, right? Iwumta, to Apodoc, health, the saguaro fruits, very, very um, nutritious. But at the end, I bring them back and they have to really think about how this does impact their culture. How will the changing of the sorrel fruit harvest impact their cultural practices? And so there's always a reflection piece. And so also, speaking of reflection, um, the project is divided um, into four parts based on the man in the maze, and they do reflect at the end of each um, part of their journey. And so they're always reflecting. They're reflecting not only about their learning, but they're reflecting about their process. And then they reflect at the end. So um, this is just you know, one example of um, a unit that we're doing at TOCC. So thank you. Sorry about that. In the essence of time, and I am so, so grateful for your patience, uh, as you have heard, you have seen, you have seen and you have learned about these processes, about these ways. And so what I'm going to do, again in the es essence of time, is to actually provide a little summary up to this point in what I have to share with you and provide an example of a process. Because I think what we can agree to is what you've learned, what we've expressed, is really about understanding perspectives and about learning together. So, these happy faces are three young indigenous scholars that I am so grateful to work with because the work that we do together is really within, to use the framework, a knowing, being, and doing together. And when you look at a circle, and uh, my culture, my people, as well as many others throughout the world, we talk about a circle, and we see this. But if you change your position, and you look at it from the side, you'll see layers. And suddenly, it may look like a spiral. And that's a very science way of looking at a circle. And that's a very natural, indigenous way of looking at what we call a circle. Because as you've heard another metaphor, braiding, braiding, seeing whole pieces brought together. And the weaving are the details that you find within that. And it forms a shape. And within that shape, it has edges. And, and in these ways of learning, they're soft edges. Because we must understand we have to grow as educators and as students, so as educators, being a lifelong student is key. And we need to allow time. That's one thing that I've learned working in the corporate world. There's always time, time, and those of us who work in projects, time, time, and it's a reality. But what must be understood is in the beginning you have to build more time because it's about gaining trust. It's about understanding perspectives, because you're going to change. You will evolve, and you need to figure out and have time to adjust and to adjust together. And so that's a process. A way of knowing becomes a way of being and a way of doing. It's all connected in that way, and that's what we call relationality as well as interdependence, is understanding we're part of. 
And what is central, which is the agenda, if you will, the intention, the mission, the vision, shifts its position accordingly. And so center is not static. And that is a Western educational model that, in the words of Dr. Cornell Piwoji, who is Comanche and Kiowa, unsettling colonial education models, flips it, as we heard from my colleague, flipping the models to understand and gain parity. It's not just about the philosophy and the theories. It is also economic. It is political. And so the framework becomes a way of applying all this learning. One of the examples that uh, I work with, with three scholars, I uh, created what's called a vi Visiting Indigenous Scholar Program. And I am on my second cohort. Uh, I bring, through a selection process, uh, scholars who are just at the beginning of their uh, exploratory stage of their research programs. And these are individuals who have worked from a viewpoint of K through 12 and then higher education because it must be about the journey of learning and how have you been a part of that. So it removes the step inside a discipline approach. It's understanding self and the journey you've been on to where you are today. So these scholars have been involved their whole lives in an educational journey. And so I asked them to learn. What do we call by, what do we mean by indigenous knowledges? What do we mean by indigenous knowledge systems? And how are those applied in real world scenarios? And so that's what I guide, mentor, and learn with indigenous scholars, such as these young men. One of the things that is important to know, this program, this model, engages each of their cultural lenses. One is Diné, is Navajo, another, is Salish and Crow nation, and another is Comanche. And coming together in a intertribal way and space is intriguing and life-changing. You see the photo of these young men. This was the orientation week for their experience. You look at them today and they are changed physically. One young man, he now has a beard and he has a cultural tattoo. <laughs> they have physically changed because of what their minds, hearts, and spirits have experienced and learned. I take them through reading um, a series of other scholarship and then applying that. And again, they're working on a focus of their research proposal within their degrees. And so they also have to learn how to be here like this. Talk to the people who are educators in a particular frame about what they've learned, about they, what they want to do and how. And so that's their experience and it can last, it's very customized. And they work as a cohort. So we meet every week, I do with them individually, and we talk about their growth and what they're learning. And as a uh, professor, I walk into my classrooms and say, I'm here to learn from you. Students eyes are like, wait, what? What? I'm not a lecturer. I'm an experiential knowledge holder and learner. So yeah, I get some attrition at times with that model. But at the end of the day, it is about how I've changed what I've learned. More importantly, how has it been applied? Because it has to be about more than philosophy and theories. 
a lot of indigenous knowledges was first entered with a romantic perspective. And how can we use these? Use is not a word found in these ways of knowing. It's about partnership. How do I partner with knowledges? Because they begin somewhere, and that's a part of what my students learn. What's the source of what we call an indigenous knowledge? Where does that come from anyway? Because education as a way of learning begins way in the future in terms of this way of knowing. It starts back here with self and it gets very intimate and deep. That's the hard part. So build time to discover self and self in relation. So that's the model that we work with. It's about being together within the realm of the sources of our knowledges. I spend a lot of time, yes, I'm an anthropologist, it's sort of a written rule, I gotta be out there in the field. I love it, but I'm not just out there. I'm out there as part of those worlds. Me, as a native person, we have what's called generalities. No, this isn't about pan-Indianism. This is about understanding self in relation. I move and work beyond my people's community, and I'm an ally. I must understand what that means, and how can I be respectful when I'm with the Adams, with the Crow, with the Diné? So I'm right there in allyship and it's a very personal way of being. And so this model teaches us to be not just collaborators, but partners, because one of the questions, who leads, who decides? We all do, but we have to make space for equality of voices, as we've heard. So the model, again, is a K-12, to understand the journey and then beyond. I have several professional certificates because they are specialized. I work within the industry of what's called cultural resource management. As an anthropologist, I work in the realm of federal government, environmental policy, natural resource management, federal Indian law. It's required of a person like me to work in those worlds and to be helpful and to remain open to what it is I have to continually learn. And so at the end of the day, with students working in such a way within this program, what have they learned? One of those students are at MIT, he's an astro engineer. Now that's a love, there was a day, another story, I wanted to be an astronaut. Life had a different plan for me, so I vicariously have lived through projects. So I've got a couple of NASA-based projects. One we talked about, but ultimately, that project is of great personal interest to me. So, working with MIT, and part of a panel of inquiry and sharing of knowledge, I posed the question, what does it mean to be indigenous off earth? What does that mean? Ask that of yourself. We do, in the Western sense, Eurocentric sense, but what if you're me? I come from a sky people. I have stories. We came from out there. So what about those of us and those voices throughout this world who think that way? It's related. It isn't about shifting priorities or interests. It's about what we call an analog in NASA speak, NOAA speak. Mars has an analog now. Four dedicated scientists have committed a year of their life. Well, my student, we're developing a lunar analog because we're going to the moon to stay. How do we be human beings there? So engaging the stories. What is already known? 
what is left to know and how do we go about it is the key here for the model that we work in. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much, and thanks for staying for as long as you did. We're way, we're somewhat over time, but we'd like to give you a chance to ask some questions. You've heard a lot. Maybe you need some time to process it. We can, we can, you know, actually get together over lunch as well. But I see there's a question. Okay, first I will introduce myself. I'm Rebecca Boger. I am at Brooklyn College. I am, which is located on the uh, unceded lands of the Lenape people. Um, I am in the Department of Environmental, uh, Earth and Environmental Sciences and also work with the uh, Interdisciplinary Program of Urban Sustainability. So, oh, and I should also say I'm the descendant of colonizers from Scotland, England, and Germany. Um, it, as education growth, uh, I come from the Western science, learning about Earth system, and it was aha, Earth system. And then I become familiarized with the indigenous people and say, oh my gosh, they knew it way long ago. They didn't call it, but it's, it's Earth system science. And then I'm working with soci sociologists and learning about the integration of human and natural systems. So the language, and there, I said, oh my gosh, indigenous people have already got it. So I, we are building, so a couple of things. Are you a uh, way of connecting globe with the indigenous is the, I recently became part of the indigenous mapping collective, which is awesome. So using geospatial technologies to empower communities, indigenous communities. Now I am in New York City, or in Brooklyn specifically. I am in an urban environment with many different peoples, a land that has been transformed. So my question is, we develop a program with inter in urban sustainability, and we're creating a master's program, is how do you in to infuse the indigenous values into, so I'm not working with indigenous peoples necessarily, but I want to incorporate that into the program. So I'm getting some ideas from you, but also I am to connect people with the land. There's community gardens, there's the oceans, there's the Million Oyster Project. So how do we envision a future? You know, it's amazing when I show the Project Manhattan, if you're familiar with it, is a recreation of the island of Manhattan, Manhattan, from the Lenape language, of what it looked like before Hudson came and discovered the land. And I say, well, look, this was what it was like a couple hundred years ago what can we make it now? So try to transform that thinking. So I'm, th you know, I'm, I'm, I don't really have a question so much of, of, as to, well, I guess how can I incorporate indigenous values into, and one last question, do any of you know of, of uh, as we may get to hire people with this new program, if funding becomes available, I'm toying with the idea, is there such a thing as an indigenous urban planner? I, I'd like to speak to that first. There are indigenous of that landscape who you have access to. That's where I'd start first. They are there. They're not invisible to us. I would start there. Be with the community. This is something I'm approached by so many programs and organizations. How do we do this? Exactly what you shared. That's always my first response. What land? What landscape? There is a people that belongs to that land. That's how first. And there are some of those programs because relocation, an element of colonization, relocated many of our peoples. We are in every major city in this country. And so you have access. Yeah, I, I just want to echo that and show you a slide. I can't, I, I, yeah. I, you can incorporate and know the values, but you can't really do that without the people. And so this is a really nice diagram that lets you think about how to approach these kind of projects 
or ways of doing things from an ethical, a culturally responsive or sensitive or involved perspective. And in Maori culture, and I know it's true of all the other ones here as well because we've had many hours of discussion, is the who has to be at the centre. The relationships are your foundation. And so you might be familiar with Simon Sinek's model of how you structure organisations or projects, which says most organisations do this wrong and put the what at the outside, but the why has to be at the centre, or well, from an Indigenous perspective, the who has to be at the, the centre. So, I, yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah, I, I, you have a duty to involve the people of the land. 